very, very good conference and very helpful to all of you um, here at Johns Hopkins University. So I think you're going to make, you will get a lot out of this today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peggy Hayslip and I'm the Associate Director for Disability Services. Um, I'm housed in the EEOC office uh, here uh, at the Homewood campus, but I travel uh, throughout the university in hospital setting and I work um, mostly with people who are dealing with issues as it relates to disability services. We're really excited um, to bring this conference to you. Um, many people don't realize that we do have an obligation under federal law to look at our communication systems across the university and hospital setting and that pertains to websites. Um, so we're very excited that we're able to do this today. Um, before I introduce the speaker, um, I wanted to just mention a few people and to thank them for their help and their support. Um, when we first started looking at this topic, there were a couple of people who were particularly uh, involved with me in uh, looking at web accessibility. And one of these people is Teal Anderson from the Digital Library Center um, here at Homewood and Debbie Savage. They've really been the impetus behind this. In addition to that, Cynthia York, who also is in the Digital Library, and she has kept us on task to make sure that we've got this conference going. <laughs> um, in addition to that, Gordon Dean is over here from Human Resources. You'll probably hear from Gordon um, after this conference because Human Resources websites are almost totally accessible at this point, and that's due to Gordon's efforts. Um, we also have a few other people, Brian Schuschler, who's on our committee. Um, a few people also from the Bloomberg facilities here that um, have helped us to put this conference together. In addition, I'd like to thank the staff in our office, Lisa Moreland, Nicole Beverly, and also Ken McDonald from Debbie's office, who have been influential in arranging the facilities today, making sure you have breakfast and um, keeping us on task in that way. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker. I've had a chance to have breakfast with her this morning, and we've had a delightful conversation. Um, Cindy Rowland was highly recommended uh, when we looked around for a speaker who could get us energized, motivated, and on target with the task of looking at websites across the university. Her name came up over and over again. She's the Associate Director at the Center for Persons with Disabilities at Utah State University. Um, she's been involved with a FIPSI grant for a number of years, uh, looking at keeping web accessibility in mind. It's called WebAIM. Um, she's looked at creating and maintaining um, websites um, that had several grants uh, through WebAIM. She's also uh, the Accessibility Validator um, in conjunction with Temple University, looking at how to make real-time audio streaming accessible. Um, she's also involved in the National Center for Disability and Access <coughs> in Education. She cha chairs the um, <coughs> Institute on Disability Access and Distance edu Education that explores accessibility ed education technologies. Move more and more in that direction, we want to hear more about this. Um, prior to coming to Utah State, which is where she got her PhD, she was in special education. That, um, her PhD is in early childhood education. She also has a degree in speech and language therapy. So she's going to tell you a little bit more about herself, but I'm really happy to have her this morning. Thank you. Thank you. I actually had that happen to me once. Everyone was 
courteous and did that and I felt right because <laughs> I had forgotten. Well, I have quite a, uh, boy, you, you've got me on a, quite a task here to energize, huh? <laughs> oh my heavens. I'm always excited to talk about uh, web accessibility. I've been in the disability community, this has been my professional life for 20 some years. And it's uh, actually, right now, although my own professional path has taken lots and lots of uh, uh, different uh, turns and twists, this is the reason I get up in the morning. You guys are going to have an opportunity to listen to me talk about something I am deeply passionate about. And um, uh, with that said, I know I have a tendency to just, you know, soapbox a few things, but I'm going to try to keep us on a fairly tight timeline. Uh, as anyone will know, Christine Luber, uh, here from George Mason, knows this about me. God help you if I catch you in a hall, <laughs> because you're just there forever, because I get so whipped in about these issues. Before we get started, though, I, I want to get a sense of what it is that all of you do. So, so first, let me ask this question. Um, how many of you would consider that the notion of web accessibility is either new or relatively new in terms of your awareness and knowledge and stuff? Okay, so a few people. How many of you would say, you know what, I know it, I've been doing it, uh, I'm trying to help other folks do it? A few people, okay, good. Now, different set of questions. Uh, how many folks, uh, how many of you are uh, technical people, web developers, people that are actually doing this work, okay? How many of you are on that administrative end where it's your charge to help set, create policy, maybe coordinate other people? Okay, I really do have my work cut up for me. <laughs> what I'm trying to do in my presentation this morning is cover a wide range of information. I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to give those of you uh, that have uh, just little bits of information on web accessibility or for whom this is a, a new topic, uh, a sense of what we're talking about, what's all the hubbub. For those of you that have been at it a while, I hope I'm peppering some things in it here and there that will be new to you uh, so that you don't consider that a good chunk of your morning is, uh, is essentially a waste of your time. I know that we're going to have a panel this afternoon, and we'll also be uh, responding to some of your specific questions, too. Okay. Um, oh, you know what? Peggy wanted me to relay a little story. We had a breakfast. She thought it would be good. Uh, she had asked me, uh, actually, I don't know exactly how this came up, but we were talking about the, uh, the genesis of web accessibility uh, uh, in my professional life. And it, it was very odd, you know, again, I've been in the disability community for years and years and years uh, in, in, as a professional. And this came about in an odd way, my focus on web access. Uh, at the center, uh, which is a, one of the university centers for excellence in, dis in developmental disabilities, research, education, and service, if that is in the long run, uh, mouthful there, the big chunk. Um, in 1995, I was the chair of the website committee there. And, it, you know, if you guys think about it, 95 wasn't that long ago, but for lots of places, that was when people were really dealing with issues of a web presence. So I was chairing a web, uh, a web committee, and we went off to our professional meetings. We were one of uh, only five in our uh, national network of 61 centers that had a web presence. Uh, so at this meeting, had a poster presentation, and we were so proud of the work that we had done as a way to provide high visibility for the work that we do at the center, which is in disability research, services, training, education, and all this thing. And a gentleman who's blind, his name's Michael, came up and he was asking me about the poster that I have. And I told him, well, Michael, we have this uh, website in our center and we do these wonderful things and we're so excited about it. And he looked at me and said, well, Cindy, can I get to that website? And I did not understand his question. I didn't know what he was asking. I didn't know how to respond. It was a moment of clarity for me, only because I had professional egg all over my face. You know, here I was standing there as uh, someone who, who touts uh, 
her own professional background as being in this field. And I didn't know what he, what he was talking about. So I went home and found out that no, he couldn't have gotten to our site at our disability center. He couldn't have gotten to any of our university sites. He couldn't have gotten to any of the four sister centers. And as I started looking at the, the problem of disability access and how endemic this problem was back in 95, and I'm sad to say we've had a little change uh, uh, at this point in time on a national scale, uh, I realized something just had to be done. Uh, so Pipsy was kind enough to give us a little, our first pot of funding. But I think that the reason that Peggy was interested in having me share this story with you is that this is one of those um, phenomena that cross disciplines. People in the technology community aren't necessarily thinking about disability. People in the disability community aren't necessarily thinking about information technology. There's been this coalescence, there's been a convergence in just the past uh, several, well, 10 years. Uh, but in terms of mainstream thought, this is just bubbling to the surface. So if you are a disability coordinator or if you're a technology person, realize that for a lot of us, this is still relatively new stuff. And uh, I guess that's, uh, that's the, did I get why you were thinking that would be good to share? Is that it's just new for all of us. Okay. Now let's see how, I, I, I consider myself to be fairly a tech, uh, tech literate, but I've not used these little remote mic, remote mouses. Okay. Right now we've got funding uh, a little bit left on uh, LAP, which is uh, through Pipsy. And we also, if anyone's interested, because I love to talk about this, we've been starting a, an initiative to work with folks in K-12 education. You know, when you think about what it is that kids in our schools are learning these days and the importance and the power of the internet in their lives. Uh, you can imagine that we've got to make sure that those learning opportunities and that content is available to all the students. But uh, if anyone's involved with school-age kids, uh, please come and visit with me at a break or at lunch or some other time, because I'd love to share what we're doing with that. Okay. I hope you all have a little quiz. I hope you. Did anyone, is there anybody that has not gone ahead and filled it out for themselves? Okay, well, as I talk on, we will cover this a little bit later. But, you know, this is just kind of an interesting thing. You don't have to turn it in, so it's just, you know, fun for you. And uh, if, if it was a little different setup, I kind of have a, a fun activity to do with, with it that gets people moving. But fill this out, uh, and after the break, we'll go over what these answers are. And it's just kind of a, a, an interest item, I think, uh, uh, for a lot of you. Although I know that the first couple questions refer to distance education. Uh, in part, we've got huge gaps in data sources right now. So these were some data sources that I could find and I could document. We don't have as many uh, sources uh, for on-campus programs. Uh, let me also ask, uh, I'm, I know that all of you are engaged in web-based efforts in your on-campus programs, you wouldn't be here. Is there anyone in this room that's also involved in any distance delivery of materials? Okay, all right. Well, there's uh, some interesting stuff for you guys to do, so if I'm not hitting some of your issues, uh, please do let me know. Okay, this is how I want to organize this morning. First, I want to just give a big, broad overview of what accessibility is, and what is it that happens when individuals with disabilities come to a website that's not designed with their needs in mind? And I'm thinking that's going to take over oh, about an hour. So, of course, I was thinking break would be at 10. <laughs> okay, so 10.30. <laughs> and uh, we are talking certainly about the law. And so I want to, uh, when we come back from the break, cover that big chunk of what it is that the law says about web access, and frankly, what it is that the law does not say. Because we have just as many statements in that latter column as we do in the former column. Um, so I'm hoping that you can all leave here today well-versed and able to go back and speak to your colleagues about where we are, uh, in, in what stages of gray yeah, is the law with 
respect to web access. And then the last is just talking about the information that you guys could be taking from here, and then of course going on to our afternoon panel. Uh, I, I did want to ask, Jeff, are you in the uh, audience? No, that's good. We'll, we'll, we'll catch him later. All right. So that's how I, I would like to organize the day today. Um, and I do have a lot of, uh, of information to share. But one of the places that I want to start is just defining our terms. You know, what is accessibility? Well, this is the definition uh, that uh, Cynthia Waddell has uh, posited. I believe it comes, uh, well, she's modified it a little. But, it, but it's basically uh, kind of a Webster style definition. And it's developing information so that it can get out to the broadest array of users. Now for those of you guys that are uh, web developers, you would probably identify this as lots of easy tricks of the trade that you're already using. For those of you that are developing, you know you have to do certain funny things to make a page look as beautiful in Netscape as it does in Internet Explorer. And that little tool, that little trick, is essentially a trick of accessibility. You want to make sure that your information is getting out to the widest array of users and that it's getting out there in a way that is making sense. Uh, again, going back to the, to the de developers, you know if you don't do certain things, uh, you get strange orders of, of your information and it's just not what you want. So we're not talking about rocket science here. We're talking about very minor. Uh, tricks of the trade that web developers can use to make sure that their information is getting out to all individuals, including those with disabilities. It really affects a lot of people. You know, when we're talking about web access, most folks are considering that web accessibility is an issue that people who are blind or visually impaired are dealing with. And yet, it is, we're dealing with lots of folks. As more and more media files are placed on the web, this is certainly pulling in individuals that have hearing impairments. Uh, individuals that have uh, challenges or impairments in their motor skills can be affected in a number of ways. Of course, this is a huge group of people. We may be talking about individuals like Christopher Reeve that have uh, uh, quadriplegia. We may be talking about someone that has um, a progressive neurologic disease so that they have either weakness or a tremor. We may be talking about folks that have uh, cerebral palsy that may have uh, other kinds of, of uh, difficulty with control uh, and again fatigue. There really is a huge range when we're talking about motor skills such that folks may not be able to use the keyboard and, the, and or the mouse. So these are issues we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, Folks that are challenged uh, in cognitive uh, uh, areas, and uh, again, this is a huge range. On one end, and I hate to even call it, call it cognitive uh, disorders, but a huge number of people with learning disabilities in our nation. And then folks with developmental disabilities, people with uh, traumatic head injuries, you know, we're going to get a, a wide range of individuals that just need a little bit of assistance to make sense of a page, so we'll be covering that. And then uh, seizure disorders. For those of you that are web developers, you may already know that depending on, on your own flicker rates, you can actually induce a certain type of seizure. And that is uh, folks that suffer from photoepilepsy can actually go into a seizure state by looking at your flashing and blinking screen. So, so you want to avoid that. We'll talk about that. Uh, my favorite is, as a woman in her mid-40s, are the age-related processes. You know, my hearing's starting to go, my, eye, my eyes are starting to go, and uh, as I get older and older and older, if I don't help y'all fix these problems, I'm going to be in the world of hurt in about 20 years. Whoops. In fact, my dad, no, 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 just stop. Is escape the middle? Right here. Right here, right here. There we go. I, I have to say, I am not a, a Windows-based user, so... Uh, the right one click thing is, is new to me. My dad has macular degeneration, and he was the, really the first, uh, uh, d first generation of professionals to use the web extensively, and then when he retired, this was his life. 
uh, between you know running down to the boat to fuss with things and emailing his daughters and getting you know uh, recipes for my mom off the web or checking on uh, new medications. I mean, this was really his life. And as he started to lose his sight, this has had a tremendous impact in the overall quality of his life and the way it is that he can stay connected to people. Uh, so for those of you that have uh, aging parents that are using technology and using the web, uh, this is something for you to think of as well. But think of it for yourself. In 30, 40 years, if all of a sudden you could no longer use the internet, and when you consider the trajectory that that is having in our society, what does that going to mean? So we have an opportunity to fix the problems for ourselves as well, which I guess is a, uh, uh, a bit of a, yeah, I don't know, a selfish reason to do so, but I, I hope we can get it done. The other thing I wanted to mention about web accessibility is that, is that it is endemic. When we did, uh, in WebA, um, before we wrote the grant, we did some preliminary uh, uh, samples. And we've been, every year as part of an external evaluation, actually we haven't been doing it, but uh, our evaluators have been going through a group somewhere between uh, two and 300 uh, randomly selected uh, post-secondary education uh, home pages and they look at them in terms of access. And the unfortunate reality, and of course we were using that as one metric to see if our project is, is helping raise awareness, is helping with the problem, are we seeing more accessible home pages. Our, our rationale, frankly, is that most institutions put most of their money on that front door. So we thought it was, if we were gonna use some little quick sample, this might make some sense for us. Well. We've gone over a five-year period of time now from about 22% uh, to it's now at about 26%. So it's really when you're looking at a, at a, at a sample of that size, the, the data are, are relatively stable, which is unfortunate. But um, that's only, that's about one in four. That's horrible when you think about it that way. And also when you realize that very few people go to a single page to access information. The, the wonder of the internet is its connectivity. Uh, we hop around from you know, place to place to place. So if we wanted to, to get you from this auditorium to, I don't know, an office somewhere in this building, and we locked three out of every four doors, assuming that this building was somehow nested and connected, could any of us get there? Uh, the reality is we probably couldn't. So we all have to take that responsibility. We all have to take the onus of this, of this difficulty. And again, this is a, a metric off of a home page, off of an institutional site where uh, typically it's in professional hands with a lot of money thrown at it. And I can't speak for, the, uh, for Johns Hopkins and how, uh, how each of you uh, does your own sites, but at least at Utah State University, most of the money goes to the front, to the, front of the building. Okay, and I won't get into a whole conversation around the use of Bobby, uh, but if any of you are interested, I'd love to uh, talk about it. I, I have mixed feelings. Yes. Could you just say what it is? Uh, yes, I, and I apologize. Uh, uh, Bobby, and you can get that, I've got it in the handout as well, it's uh, watchfire.com, is an accessibility validator, and what you can do is put, um, put your own pages into it, and it will give you kind of a running t a tally of things that are, uh, that would meet an accessibility standard or that wouldn't. The dilemma, of course, is that people have been using it um, in an automatic way, as if whatever Bobby says is real. So uh, that's the, the biggest dilemma that I have with it. There still needs to be a human interaction, a human connection uh, to that analysis. And it's a fabulous place to start if you are new to this and want to test your own pages to see if you're running into accessibility problems. The report that you end up with is a little complicated as well. And I've got some other suggestions on some validators. Yes? Um, how, have the, how have the guidelines for um, validation with Bobby changed in the past five years or so? Because I know when I first started 
doing web development as a professional. I was doing government websites, and the things that Bobby asked for were basically a need. We couldn't do them because they, our pages would have been so primitive. Right, right. And you've got a great question, and let me cover that towards the end of this time because I've got a, a little, little tiny slide on some validators, um, and that will help the rest of the group as well that aren't as familiar to kind of get up to speed with that. But if I don't answer that, you holler a little bit later when I get to that slide on validators. Yes. Could you repeat the URL to get to the uh, Yes, I can. And let me, in fact, I'll probably end up by taking all of, all of us to it. <coughs> okay. If you were to go to, it's uh, uh, bobby.watchfire.com. That will, get, that will get you to Bobby. And it was a, a unit out of uh, uh, CAST, if any of you guys have seen it. It's a unit for, uh, oh my goodness, accessible, uh, uh, looking for a scheme, special technologies. I think. Anyway, it, it's out here, I can tell you that much. <laughs> it's out on this, on this coast. All right. Um, <laughs> The reason that I was showing you a little snapshot on post-secondary yet is in that theme of what is accessibility. My point is, is that accessibility is a huge problem in education. We know that all of you are using the web for more functions right now than you have ever used the web for. In fact, let me ask uh, this question. Okay, we know that courses are supported using the web, so people can uh, get syllabi, they can get readings, they can take exams. Uh, how else uh, is the web being used in your shop? Yes? Course handouts. Okay, course handouts. Even above and beyond courses, what's happening on your campuses? Yeah. Registration and grade lookup. Yes. <coughs> Students can get their grades, they can register online, yeah. Library services. Library services, which is huge. That is huge. The ability for a student to conduct research whether it's related to a course or independent, it's so critical. Yes? Access to financial information. Access to financial information. And in fact, not just financial aid, uh, but housing, um, uh, job, uh, sometimes they post jobs on the web. It, uh, what are some other ways? Yeah? Uh, purchasing software and licenses. Absolutely. People can go and go to a place online and get the stuff that they need. Uh, maybe for their unit. So this might be a staff function. And I'm glad you're bringing that up because we really are talking not just about students but also about staff. Yeah? Uh, faculty CVs and research data. Good. That's right. Uh, faculty members want to get their information out there as much as, as anybody else. Applications for admissions are great. Yep, admissions. Uh, yeah? Yeah, and, it, and it, right now it's even going beyond the PowerPoint. We're now getting to that to that generation where video files are being put online of actual lectures. You know, uh, do you guys have your school newspaper online? Yes. Okay. How about little cyber cafes where students can chat and interact and have some social arenas? Is that happening? Yes. Out here. Okay. So. What we're really talking about here, and as much as I know I'll be bringing up examples of courses and, and whatnot, we're really talking about the entire architecture of the, of the web as, as it relates to, to all 11 campuses and all of your federal grants. I mean, it's this enormous thing. So let's keep in mind, for the rest of the day, that we're talking about virtually everything that goes in or out of, the, of this campus and uh, hits either faculty members or staff members. Uh, I'm sorry, faculty, well, faculty, staff, or students. So it's, it's everywhere. The last point I want to bring up about access in post-secondary ed, which is important for you guys, is that very, very few entities are actually trying to coordinate this very important issue. Now, I know that the, the team that Peggy's talking about is trying to do that. In fact, Peggy, this is part of that effort, isn't it? And um, I believe, well, I happen to know that Johns Hopkins does not have any guidelines, standards, policies, anything with respect to access 
But if I'm understanding this right, and I know there are people in the room that will correct me if I'm not, uh, this may uh, help raise the level of the dialogue across the campuses so that important decisions can be made about what direction needs to be taken on these campuses. Did I get that about right? Okay. All right. Now we're going to get into the fun stuff. Oh, wait a minute. There we go. Now we're going to get into the fun stuff. Okay. Um, does any, uh, would anyone like to share how it is that an individual who is blind accesses content on the web, on the website? I, I know that there are some of you that are, that know that, but share, share for others. They would use a software program that can read the text and um, speech, um, voice or whatever, speech or whatever. It's output, yes. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, text is actually read. Oops, what did I get now? He's absolutely right. There are some, there are some bits of software, some assistive technologies. And what they do is they go behind what it is that we see. They go back into the code and they read it in what is supposed to be a fairly intelligent way. But of course, because they're actually reading the code, they're reading what it is any of you developers are putting into the code, okay? Uh, the most commonly used are JAWS, uh, Window Eyes, and IBM Homepage Reader. Uh, these things not only read the, the web, uh, but they read the entire <coughs> operating system. Well, not IBM Homepage Reader, but you guys don't need that level of detail. So they're reading those uh, text elements on a page, and uh, think about it this way. <laughs> if your monitor was off, could you use the mouse? Probably not. So these individuals are using the keyboard to navigate around. So uh, already you can start thinking of probably problems that are, that are happening. And then they're using a bunch of shortcuts um, uh, to get around. Now one of the things that I want to do is show you, and let me see if I can get to this. Hmm. Of course, I won't know which one I've got. Yeah. Table with three columns and seven rows. Link, graphic, link for prospective students. Link, graphic, number 965,151,481,950. Link, graphic, number 965,151,535,990. Link, graphic, link for alumni. Link, news vertical bar. Link, calendar vertical bar. Link, campus diversity vertical bar. Link, survival classes vertical bar. Okay, let me just stop right there. 
Um, anything that are, that's just popping up in your mind about the ease of listening to a website, problems listening to a website? I'm hearing m mutterings. <laughs> yes. It goes fast, yes. And you were saying? Brackets. Okay. Okay. Uh, you guys all heard that goofy nine million blah blah blah, and that's because uh, when it went, the the program is trying to find something to reference uh, an image, basically. <coughs> and up at the main, the about U of A uh, index search, those are those are images, and. Sometimes a screen reader will say something like image, or actually if it's, a, if it's an image file, it'll give the file name, you know, uh, 32.jpg, or you know, whatever it happens to be. Uh, in this instance, because this is an image map, it's trying to locate the actual coordinates on the server, if that makes sense. So that's why you're getting these fans tabulous numbers that are, it's, it's doing the best it can to give you as much information as it has, but it's not logical. It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, so you can see right from here uh, that one of the dilemmas will be making sure that things that are what, what, what's called a non-text element, things that are images and graphics, have some kind of textual element that can make sense. Let me just keep going for a second. And I want to show you one of the link links to do vertical bar link apply vertical bar link library vertical bar link history link contact information vertical bar link class schedule vertical bar in enter. Okay. Uh, what I want to show you on this one. Ah. Okay, link artwork from the ice exhibit table uh, end. Image map link. Who Hang on, I'm going to have to go and read. Image map link. Shift tab. Search dot it. Shift tab. Artwork from the ice link. Shift tab. Class schedule link. Enter. Class schedule supplement. Link back to home page. Class schedule supplement. The following classes were added after the official schedule was printed. Period. Okay. This is what I wanted to. This is just a typical class schedule uh, that we did a mock-up. And you can see it's just in a regular old table format. It's a, you know, it's data table. Um, now what I'd like everyone to do is we need to get to uh, biology uh, 250, and we need to know what room number this is. So um, we're going to see if you guys can, can find this information. And what I can tell you from a legal standpoint, the information you're going to hear is accessible. Here we go. Table with 10 columns and 5 rows. Department code. Class number. Section. Max enrollment. Current enrollment. Room number. Days. Start time. End time. Instructor. Bio. 100. 1. 15. 13. 5. Mon comma. When comma. Friday. 10 o'clock. 11 o'clock. Mag. 100, 2, 15, 7, 5, 2, comma, 2, 11 o'clock, 12, 30, inch, 250, 1, 15, 9, 6, 2, comma, 2, 9 o'clock, 10, 30, mag. Okay, what room are you guys going to? Uh, <laughs> mag. <laughs> Uh, and let me just remind you that the information you got was accessible, right? You heard what you heard the answer. Uh, for Biology 250, you're going to room number six in that particular building. Um, and so certainly none of you ended up at the wrong place, correct? <laughs> now this is important because let's remember uh, individuals with disabilities have in in in. The nice thing is, it's not just my opinion. We, we codified this in federal law. <laughs> they have a right to independence. They have a, a legal right to their dignity. So when we get information in such a way that it is not understandable, and they're having to ask people again, we've really failed. 
On the face of it, this, this information was, uh, was accessible to each and every one of you. And we all would agree it's completely uh, not use It is unusable. Unusable information. Um, there, of course, are some uh, really quick and easy ways to take uh, data tables and make them accessible. Uh, our webaim.org site, I'll we'll just tell any of the technical folks that are in the audience, we have tutorials on just about everything you can imagine. So you can just go there and, and just grab it. But it's basically good putting in, uh, if you do the headers, column the row headers, the assistive technologies would then tell you uh, that it is class number 250, room number 6. I mean, it, it associates the data cells with the row and uh, column headers. Yes? Can you pause that and we'll, uh, go back? Yeah, I can. Uh, I mean, not, no, not can you, but can one. Oh, oh yes. Absolutely. You can go up and down. You can navigate in any direction that you would want. Absolutely. Um, but if you're thinking of that from the standpoint of, um, let's see, them getting uh, getting some kind of a reference, is that what you were thinking? I mean, you might have heard 250 and then lost track as it went across. Correct. And then so you can pause it and right. rewind. Yes, yeah, uh, you could. You could, technically. And, and what she's talking about here is that you guys all knew you were looking for 250. And then you got mired in all of this. It was like, oh my gosh, I have no idea what I'm looking for here. Uh, once you got to this, you could, or you, at any point in time, you could go up. But let's think about that. Did you guys really remember the sequence? So if this was a data table that had 10, I mean, at what point is it, uh, it, is, is it unseemly? You know, three columns, 20 columns, at what point would you require the user to have to go up maybe 50 rows to the top, and then remember how many uh, how many rows to go back down to get the information that you want. Uh oh, <laughs> we are waiting to do something. So uh, you know, be thinking about that. I mean, if you have a simple little <coughs> tiny four by four, I mean, I can see that. But yes.
single one of these, you can get to tutorials on our website and, and just uh, figure that out. This is one of my favorites. I love this. People with, uh, with assistive technology such as JAWS use the tab key so that they can skip from link to link because they don't want to have to listen to everything you all have to say. Can you imagine having to hear the introductory paragraph on every single web page all the time before you can get to a link? So they use a, 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 a function that skips from link to link to link. Well, how often are they skipping to uh, more, like here? Additional info, like here, you know, it, it's, it doesn't make any sense. So you want to make sure that your links are going to be meaningful as, they're, as they are read. Uh, so it may be something like um, uh, assignment one, uh, and that, that is what you link, because then when they hop to it, that's what they're going to hear, or whatever it happens to be. Okay. But I'm not going to go through all the technical information, because, in part because of our time, in part because of the split of the audience, and I don't want those of you that aren't web developers to feel a little bit left out here. All right. Low vision. Uh, does anyone know how folks that have very low vision are accessing the web? Or how they're making sense out of it? Yes? Magnifying the size of the text. Bingo. Magnifying the size of your text. So they're basically going to blow the screen up, okay? And that is what they're going to do. Um, Zoom text is probably the most uh, common uh, to use. And now I'm going to take us to another little thing. Let's see if I can get the right one. Oh, that's, oh, you know what I'm taking you guys to, and I should just let you know about this. Um, we, we do have, uh, on our WebM site, we do have a simulation on low vision, but I said, ah, I'm not going to put you guys through another simulation, but if you want to use it for other people, this is great. There is the greatest little tool, opera.com, it's the number three browser, it's free downloadable. I love it for testing purposes. Um, and actually, I'm going to show you that um, you can turn off styles and colors. Check this out. Ooh. Okay. Here we just turned off all the images. Um, and you can get it, in, you can just get all kinds of different views. Okay. So if you want to. Oh, I turned off the images. So if you want to kind of see a, linear, a linearized view of your page, uh, turn off styles and colors and, and pages. There we go. Okay. So if I turn off colors, I can turn off styles, I can linearize, uh, turn off images, you'll get a sense of how the assistive technologies are going to come in. So it's really, and, and uh, extract your information. So it's really helpful, especially if you have a very complex uh, table you use for layout. And you're not sure, well, uh, of course, it's reading, uh, uh, assistive technologies are going to read it in a logical table, going from one chunk to the next, depending on how you've layered things. Uh, the chunk that you're hoping people would actually read second, because that's what it looks like on the page, they're reading last, if that makes sense. So this is a great little tool. This is the other reason I love um, Opera. And uh, I told my dad about it, and he loves it too. Um, and Gordon, you're going to want this. Over here, you can see that there's this percent. And I'm just going to blow this little puppy up. Aha! This is how somebody that has low vision is going to be looking at your pages. Okay? They're going to blow it way the heck up. There we go. And they're going to just be scrolling. Now, I, don't, I lost the scroll bar down here probably because of all of this menu stuff. Uh, and you can see that this particular, and I apologize if this developer is in the office, I didn't really pick this, uh, pick your page on purpose. Um, but you can see we would have to do considerable uh, left and right scrolling as well. And what I should tell you is that beyond about 400%, if anyone's having to go beyond 400%, they're probably, and you're getting a better view too because you guys are far away. I can tell you this is actually very pixelated here on the, on the monitor. Um, beyond 400%, the recommendation would be that they would be using uh, a, a, 
screen reader and that kind of assistive technology rather than viewing things visually. <coughs> but the biggest problems that, that folks get into, frankly, <coughs> excuse me, uh -oh, the dreaded no food or drink. <laughs> and the finger wear. Excuse me. The biggest dilemma that folks get into um, from a design standpoint is besides using uh, uh, image text instead of real text, which it looks like we've got here on the Johns Hopkins. You know, you look at this and then look at the clarity. This is all an image I can just tell. Now look at that. Look at that real text down at the bottom. Isn't that nice and clear? Isn't that nice and dry? But <coughs> if I had my uh, uh, horizontal scroll button, we'd be scrolling back and forth and back and forth and it would be making me crazy. Uh, so using uh, fixed widths, absolute widths, makes it such that someone's going to have to scroll and it's going, going to be uh, quite, quite hard for them. Now let me go to, <coughs> no, I hope I don't get into a big copying fit here. back to the main so you can see. Oh, we have turned off all the pages. There we go. All right. So one of the ways that you can get around this, in fact, let me just go into, um, into one of our pages. Okay. And what you'll see when we blow it up is that because the uh, sizes are relative, It's all right there. All right in that screen. Do you see that? So what it's doing is it's it's telling uh, uh, it's it's telling the uh, the browser to make my text uh, proportionate to the window that I'm in. Okay. So now I guess what I don't have to um, uh, scroll side to side. I'm getting all of the critical information I need right here. And isn't that just a lovely thing? <coughs> need to fix to make uh, proportional widths, widths rather than absolute or fixed widths. So that's just that's just a quick one. Okay, let me get back to this. But I would um, encourage you guys to go and get the free downloadable opera and look at your own pages, and look at the degree to which you are forcing people to scroll, look at the degree to which uh, uh, folks are um, going to have to deal with pixelated uh, text, or actually if we had any pictures, it probably would have been the same as well. So just be thinking about that, and have lots of good contacts. Okay. All right, colorblindness is actually the last uh, uh, area under vision that I want to cover. And does anyone happen to know how many people, uh, well, what the percentage of the male population that has color blindness? 12%? <laughs> <laughs> she knows. <laughs> how about in the female population? 3%? Yeah, good, you are guessing. Actually, I think it's like 0.5 or something like that. I mean, it's just very, very low. Um, but it does happen. And there are you know, several different kinds of uh, color blindness. Uh, the most typical is, and I never know if I say this right, is it Deterino? Is, any, is anyone here on a vision special? Anyway, it's the red green thing, but there are other ones too, okay? Um, oh shoot, I was supposed to find out who was, who was gonna win that million dollars, and I pressed the button instead. Another nice free thing, if you go to bizcheck.com, uh, you, uh, you can either check some of your pages online and they'll turn off the colors for you so you can look and see if there's a problem. Or you can download it and you can actually use it inside of Photoshop. It's very cool. And it will help you um, see where you're running into problems. Okay. This is why it's a problem. Oh, wait. Okay. This, uh, as 
as I develop educational media, you know, I'm doing all kinds of different uh, interfaces. So here I've got red and green apples, and my instructions to the students are to, you know, click on any red or green apples to begin and any red apples to stop. So how are you guys doing? Are you getting the red and the green apples? How about this? Um, if, if somehow I'm telling you to go ahead and move the red car, you know, to point A and in your little educational path. This is, and this may even be a CD-ROM that I'm thinking of doing. Okay, I, I guessed it right, but that was only a guess. What, what I am getting to here is that anytime you are using color alone to convey important content, you're getting into trouble. So just be aware of that. Here's another one. Okay. I sent you off into the woods. Now, I do expect that any of you that have um, uh, any of those red mushrooms in your possession, you will just put them down right away. So, do you have that? <laughs> Content is an important thing. Now, how, could, how else could that be dealt with? How could they have uh, mentioned it? Italicize all of the stuff that's red or something like that. Exactly. Italicize. Use an asterisk. Put it in different columns. I mean, there's so many ways visually to separate that out. I, I know this is a true story. Um, off of our faculty and staff page, we have in personnel all of the holidays for, for all of us. And faculty actually <coughs> get um, uh, more holidays than staff. <laughs> and yeah, that's that sound but what they did is they put uh, the faculty holidays in red and the staff holidays in green. And it indicated that the, you know, below is a listing of faculty and staff holidays. But well, we had one member of our staff that was just gone a lot. And finally, when her administrator asked her about that, she referenced this page. Well, she's colorblind. Who would have guessed? She thought these were all of her days off. I mean, this is a true story. This is a perfect example of why you can't use color alone to convey content. So just think about that as, as we're doing the stuff. <laughs> okay. Now, what's going to be the problem here? We've already kind of talked about it. Media files are being used more and more and more in education. I love telling the story. This was about. So oh, five, six years ago, um, we had a new president at our university. And right off the website was a link to his inaugural address. And if I was an individual that was hearing impaired or, or that was deaf, I would have clicked on it and just seen, you know, lips moving, uh, you know, in the regalia. Streaming will never be good enough for lip reading. It's not going to happen. We've got to get over it. <laughs> we've got to realize that folks, plus we've got to realize that there's a lot of important content that is conveyed, conveyed by a narrator or by someone else. So, okay. Uh, also, I do want to just remind folks that not everyone that's deaf or hearing impaired signs. There's, uh, in fact, a, a part of the deaf community that, that you know, absolutely uh, does not want to use signs. So the, the best thing to do is not to figure out how you're going to get the bottom corner of the screen, put a sign language interpreter on your media files. That's not a good idea either. Plus, all of you guys that have seen streamed media knows that depending on the uh, speed of your connection, the traffic at the time, you may get little bumps and blips and, you know, there are going to be problems anywhere. Okay. Oh, wait. Let me go to something. All right. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is, here we go. There's just a lot, oh wait, I'm going to, hang on, I'm going to close that one. There is just the most beautiful um, narration and uh, content that is sitting behind this, uh, actually in this whole series. 
uh, this is certainly educationally relevant. Many of you are engaged in uh, grants and projects right now that are creating uh, resources just like this uh, for folks. If this is what you've got, you might as well just close the browser down now because you're not going to get the content. Now, let me go back and getting the content. So something as simple as providing captions enable an entire population of individuals to get the to get the content that your developers would intend them to get. And they're going to be able to benefit from those educational opportunities or those <coughs> employment opportunities or whatever it happens to be. Uh, so on one hand it is very it, it, on one hand, it's a no-brainer that if you're, if you're talking about providing uh, accessible web content for the deaf community, you're going to provide may not be an issue for some of the rest of you. But just go away with that notion that if this is really what you got, there is no reason for you to stay connected because you're not going to get anything educational out of that at all. There will be no value at all to this. All right. So hopefully that made its own point. Obviously, uh, students and staff need you to provide, uh, at a minimum, transcripts. And what I, well, actually, what one aspect, well, we'll get into this whole legal thing. There is um, perhaps a guideline that, a standard that may apply to you that would require simultaneous captions, which is what we saw. And the reason that that is better than a transcript is that it's hard to watch video and read a transcript. I mean, you, you, your vision is just diverted, so it's more difficult. Although what I've got to also say is for those individuals that are deaf blind, you know, AKA Helen Keller, they need a transcript because they're going to be running that through some assistive technology that is actually, it's the coolest thing. It's <laughs> it's, uh, it's called a refreshable, refreshable Braille display. And if you guys remember back in the 70s, I mean, this is, I'm just, you know, back to my roots here. Those funny things with the pins and you put your hand through it, the pins would like poke, poke out. Well, a refreshable Braille display, it actually raises the pins up, and then the person reads Braille along it, hits enter, and then the next line comes up for them. So it's just like listening to a screen reader that you guys listen to, but it's in Braille. So those folks actually need a transcript because they're going to be running that through a refreshable Braille display to be getting at the content. So that's the, the one little thing. And you know, I've just got to say this, it sounds so glib, but think about what Helen Keller could have done in her life if she had had the power to use. Think about that just for a second. If any of you guys know much about the history of, of her life and, and the influence that she had in this in this country, it's just amazing. All right, how are we doing? We're hanging in there. We talked a little bit about folks that have um, motor impairments, and what we're really talking about are individuals that uh, may need alternate ways to get into the computer. Okay. And that's because they're using an array of, an array of assistive technologies. It may be something as uh, benign as just uh, they need a little bit bigger you know, keyboard so that they, if they don't have really good control, they can get their hands where they need it to go. Or uh, even a trackball for a mouse so that they're not having to use that fine control. But we do have folks that are using you know, eye recognition uh, to move around and lots of voice recognition, all kinds of stuff. And because of that, um, we need to make sure that they have full keyboard access and that it's uh, in a way that is going to make sense for them. 
So if any of you guys are designing, you know, some really fun little applets and scripts and stuff like that that are moving things around, that's probably not good for them because they may chase that Intel, you know, the cows get home. The other thing that I want to show, let's see, where did it go? Okay. Oh, why is this doing this to me? Uh, I guess. I guess I say yes. No? <coughs> One more time. I know. I'll just go in here and do it differently. Um, the other thing that I'm going to bring, okay, bring up, is that um, if you have the same navigation, and it's a long list, you're going to want a way for individuals to be able to skip that navigation. So CNN has, over on that left nav, that's a pretty constant thing. But they also have this major uh, uh, layout uh, in a table form. Now, pretend for a second that I uh, am set up in a way, the, the best control I have is off of a head switch, so every time I want to hit a tab, I'm doing this with my head, okay? To switch from, from the next, one to the next. And let's see, I want to find uh, weather in my hometown, Logan, Utah, because, you know, it was 16 degrees yesterday. <laughs> so I'm going to just hit the tab key, let's see. So I'm on the address bar. And now I'm on the main. You guys can probably see. I can't see where it just. Does anyone see where it is? Oh, okay. Member services. Guess what? Let's see. We are okay. Let's see if we even get out of here. Okay, now we're on roll. One thing I will tell you for any of you guys that are doing flash development, sometimes you can get the user trapped in that flash element, and they will never get out as long as they live. So make sure there's an escape route if you're using Flash, and sometimes people do a little banner. But those folks just get absolutely crap. The point is, it's got to all be keyboard accessible or you're in trouble. Okay, so now I've got to hit my head about a half a dozen times. Okay, now I'm going to hit Enter. And I'm doing pretty good. But see how I have to start all the way now at the top? <laughs> And in fact, I can, I have to go all the way through. Wouldn't it be nice, help me out with, with, if we actually get to, oh my gosh. Oh. Soon, that personalized weather will get there. I don't even really know where we are. Um, did it just highlight or select location from a list? Okay. Okay. So I probably can't even see it, is what you guys are thinking. I think you need to keep tabbing. I do. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh, okay, I guess I could have gone. Okay, there we go. Woo! Okay. I know. Ah, make it stop. Yeah. I made it stop. Okay. So I'm really happy I'm here because apparently it's four below zero. <laughs> My point is, if I was really doing all of that fuss and bother with a head switch, I think I'd have a headache by about now. And, and the point is, at a certain point, I'm going to just disengage. And yet it would be so easy for... Let's see, let me just go to our center site. <laughs> it's so easy to just add this, skip to the main content. So if I'm using, if I'm tabbing through, one of the very first things that I get, I'm at CPD, okay, I'm at skip to main. So I enter it and boom, I'm on the main contents for that page. And if I go anywhere into the deeper into the site, let me just go um, let me just go into divisions, just the heck of it, maybe. Okay. 
Same thing. I can go uh, anywhere in here, and I always get to that skip to the main content or skip nav or something like that, and boom, right to the middle of what I want to be looking at. So where's, where's uh, the focus is now, there's just basically been an anchor that was added. It's at divisions now. So if I hit tab, it should go to exemplary services. Where did it go? Oh. That is weird. Well, it's supposed to be right at, right there. So I'll have to check. But you get the sense of it. Yeah, just simple, simple, easy. Uh, you guys want to all agree, none of this stuff is any big deal. It just makes content so much easier for someone to access it. Again, we're not having to go through all kinds of fuss and bother. Okay. And, let's see. Oh, now we're going to move on and we're almost at the end of this part. Individuals that have cognitive impairments, of course, have lots of needs. Now, what I've got to tell you is within the Web accessibility uh, uh, community, there's a huge argument going on, and there has been for years, about uh, uh, making sure that our content can be accessed by everyone, including those with cognitive impairments, because most of all of the stuff that's important here is important in just good, usable design. And that's what I want to tell you. If you're using standards of good usability, you're probably getting most of this anyway, but I'm just going to run through a few of them. Okay. So we've got the main problem where if you've got a really complex layout, people may be confused. And if you've got a lot of text or of verbiage that is, you know, if you've pontificated a little, little much, you may have students that are at a disadvantage or faculty members. Okay. Um, interestingly enough, sometimes, even though we're talking about uh, difficulty processing information, sometimes actually visual information can help them. I'm going to give you an example of that. All right, here we've got a phrase, just the phrase, how, and this is a perfect kind of a dyslexia kind of thing where word boundaries and reading can be a problem. How about if I pair that with something that's visual for you? We all know what that is. And probably, in the absence of that picture and some context, you probably would have had a harder time or would have taken a longer time to get that. Now, some of you might have gotten that earlier because you peeked ahead in your hand box. But, but uh, you see how, what's important uh, in this, I think, is that a lot of times people say to themselves, well, I just, because of folks that are blind, I can't have any images, I can't have any graphics. And yet, doing that disadvantages people that have cognitive problems because they need the context. They need to be able to pair things to help them make sense. So the, the thing that I would want you to go away with is that it is possible to design for everybody, to design in an accessible way that still has a lot of the spiffy things that you all like to design in, has a beautiful look and feel. In fact, someone in our staff, Paul Bowman, this was years ago, uh, actually before Barnes & Noble was sued by a consumer group, um, took uh, the front page of the Barnes & Noble site and remade it in an accessible site. Side to side, same look and feel. He, um, you know, he bet us all to figure out which one was the accessible version. And without looking at the source code, we didn't know. So you can do things in as beautiful and as flashy a way as you want to. Um, but you know, we just did that just to, to make the point that it can be done. And then we quickly took it off our site because we didn't want there to be an impression that we were prompting consumer groups to sue people. So that um, comparison is no longer on our site, although if anyone were to ask for it, I could probably uh, take you to our little hidden URL. Uh, but they were sued. <laughs> and they settled out of court for, I imagine, a goodly sum of money. Okay, well, this is maybe more of a K-12 issue, but you guys all know the hopping and leaping and swirling graphics. Um, it's really, it's really hard when you've got a lot of stuff moving around the page to get to things, okay? If you have any of those, take them off your site. They're, no, this is, 
this is a gratuitous graphic if I've ever seen one. All right. Last thing that I wanted to um, uh, hit, oh, is also to make sure that you're not putting time limits on things. Uh, well, I shouldn't say it. I shouldn't say it that way. There are some instances, let's say it is an, an exam, where students are going to take a quiz and they have 10 minutes and that's it. And that's what you've been uh, asked to design and you can design it that way. Or does your campus use like Blackboard or WebCT, one of those yeah. course management systems? Okay. So there would be a way for faculty members to create things that are time limited. Um, just know that you've got, to, you've got to have in your bag a way to uncreate it in the event that Peggy's office calls and says, you know, we have a student in your classroom that's going to need more time on that quiz. You can't have the response, well, they have to do it in 10 minutes. <laughs> that's the way to do it. There have to be ways around that. Um, actually, we have a, a gentleman in our work group uh, uh, who's blind, and he's trying to use some online uh, banking stuff. And they've worked it out so that he can access a lot of it with his uh, JAWS screen reader. But it keeps timing out on him. Because they don't have a skip to main. He has to go through like every menu on every page to get to anything. And before he can get to the final thing, he's timed out. So, you know, this is actually an important uh, thing to think about for individuals, uh, let's say, with learning disabilities who just need a little more time to, to read. They just need a little more time to process information. It doesn't mean they're not getting it. But you've got to have a way to do that. Um, the other thing that I am going to say, too, about, uh, and I'm flipping around a little bit, uh, individuals that are uh, blind and <coughs> using screen readers, they absolutely hate things that self-refresh, like a lot of uh, chat programs are on auto-refresh. Guess what happens to them? They're kicked back to the top of every page every time it refreshes. Think about that. You're trying to chat, and every 30 seconds you're thrown up to the top. Well, you never actually get down to be able to chat. And there are ways around that. There's some HTML-based chats. Actually, Blackboard has now created an accessible Java-based chat, but I'm getting too technical now, so it's my fault. OK. Now, I have for you the secret of everlasting happiness, OK? So here you go. Oh, <laughs> it was your one opportunity. I'm sorry. Well, maybe, maybe you guys will catch this some other time. So. <laughs> We also have, we've got simulations all over the place. You know, we've got the, we have screen reader, low vision, we have cognitive one, we've got stuff all over the place. But, you know, I, I had to pick it. Okay, so for those of you that are technical, here's some information that would be of use to you. It's also in your handout. But when you look at this, there's an amazing cons the constancy of information in terms of just good usable design, right? We have consistent layout so that your user goes from one page to the next and can predict where they're going to be. Um, you know, chunk things, uh, provide. Yeah, oh, uh, pet peeve. <laughs> Those long lists, it, you know, alphabetical or, or otherwise. Actually, alpha, doing it alphabetical is chunky. But I've gone to some pages that, let's say, have lists of links, and it's just a list of links. It's not in any order by topic. It may not be in any order by alphabetical, you know, listing. It's just a list, and it goes on forever. And man, that kind of stuff is just horrible, horrible to get through. Um, if you ever want to try to do, uh, to, to emulate actually uh, uh, using your website with some different processing stuff, go ahead and, and turn your mouse around and try to navigate your website. <laughs> because you know, every way you think it's supposed to go, it doesn't. And, and if you can do that, you probably have a clear enough and more predictable enough uh, uh, site that, that folks with cognitive impairments can look at and get around. Okay. Uh, this is just uh, just really quick. You know, if we've got, oh, by the way, I hope no one in this room has put a little question on trouble. <laughs> so just avoid this. But, you know, I was hoping none of you guys would be doing this kind of stuff anyway. All right. So in summary, and then we're going to take a quick break because I promised 10.30, and it is. Here's the bottom line. You can't
cannot create anything that can only be used by one modality. So do not create something that requires a mouse. You know those on-mouse rollovers? Now some of them are just like, you know, button flow, so who cares? That's not content. But some of them give you access to the rest of the menu. <laughs> you know? So take care of that. Don't do that. There are workarounds for all of that stuff. Uh, make sure that what you've got doesn't require, sorry, that you've got, if you've got an image or a graphic, that there's some alternative text in the code. <coughs> if you've got a chart, um, well, there's, there's some, <coughs> I can go on about all these <coughs> fixes. Uh, there are uh, pieces of software uh, that will even interpret charts for you in a dynamic way. Corda Technologies uh, does that. Um, but providing um, the not yet supported uh, long desk, the long description, <coughs> D-Link, um, you know, that is just basically a link to another page. Uh, so if you have, let's say, oh, a map of Lewis and Clark's, you know, westward, you know, expand of their, their trek west, uh, that faculty member ought to be able to provide why it is that they put that in there. There's probably some content that they would want someone to see, and that could be put in a longer description. So those are, those are ways you can get around that side of um, And then you see here in the so as long as you guys are comfortable that the people have multiple modalities that they can get your information, you're in good hands. There's lots and lots of ways to do this. Uh, but for right now, we are going to take a break. Oh, you know what I'm going to do, though? I'm going to do this one thing. Because when we come back, we're going to talk about the law. Well, we're almost. Oh, you know, last, I'm going to do this last slide. There's really three reasons that we create accessibility. And uh, then we're going to take a break. But you guys are going to have to hear about two of them now. First off, flat out, it's that moral high ground. It is just, it is the right thing to do. And I don't think you guys would be here now if you didn't understand the importance of fairness in our society, to be honest. And it's a smart thing to do. Uh, you've got basically paying clients, <laughs> called students, <laughs> that have a right to access information. Uh, if you're doing distance ed, you know that uh, people are going to give you money if they can access your content. Uh, quick fact, uh, in 1998, uh, a woman by the name, uh, last name is Prager, uh, reported data, it was uh, reported uh, analysis of some 95 census data. And at that time, so this is, you know, this is quite a while ago, um, Individuals with disabilities in the U.S. alone have annual discretionary income. So once the bills are paid, this is their walking around chump change, $179 billion. Now they are spending that money somewhere. And I will tell you that they will be spending it in e-commerce, in e-education, in lots of things if they can have access to it. So it is, a, it is a very smart thing to do. Um, from a web standpoint, your pages will load quicker. You'll have cleaner code if it's accessible. Lots of really important web reasons. Uh, you know, you end up by validating to either uh, HTML or XHTML or XML or CSS, whatever you guys are designing it, it would be better. Plus, things that are accessible are compatible with PDAs, with cell phones, with you know, we have this wireless explosion that is uh, beginning. And it will be those sites, it will be those products that are accessible to people with disabilities that will also load and will also be able to be used in uh, the wireless world as, as we know it right now. So, with that said, uh, we will come back and start the next section, which is the third reason we create accessibility. Uh, ten minutes and um, come on down and I'll stay right here if anyone wants to ask specific questions. And, uh, All righty. The Center for Secondary Institutions that offer this and said, uh, how many of them use the internet as a primary means of distance ed? Any guesses? 
gave me Peggy. All right. The third reason, I hope, I hope that was just kind of a little bit of fun for you today. The third reason that we create uh, accessibly is the law. And before I get into the legal stuff, there's two points I would like to cover. <coughs> I almost hate to suck on this because then I'll just sound funny, but I guess it's better than listening to you. Okay. The first thing that I'd like to mention is that um, I just want to emphasize that although a lot of my uh, overheads, handouts, are talking about students, I think it's just because of the kind of the grant mode mind that I'm in. We really are talking about everyone that is touched by Johns Hopkins. I can think of some examples of faculty members and staff members that have disabilities on other campuses that benefit or uh, are barred from doing what they need to do because of uh, an inaccessible site. Uh, one of them, a gentleman, uh, oh my goodness. I'm thinking it's Nebraska. It could have been Kansas. It's one of those plain states that goes on forever. And uh, their department was requiring all faculty members to carry at least one class that was distance-based. He was blind, and he was uh, trying to do this. They had a chat program that was not accessible. It was a Java-based chat program. Excuse me. And in order for him to do his job, what they had done is they had hired a reader to come and sit and read his screen because his, his screen reader could not uh, get into, into that chat program. And that was just not, that was not an option for him because now he's having to schedule, you know, between kind of the 8 and 5 kind of thing. Sometimes his students wanted to chat at 8 at night and that would have been great for him. Go home, have a little dinner, you know, get online, chat with a couple of students. Um, so it is your staff members. And it is your constituents. And let me make this part really clear. <laughs> for those of you that are creating resources for the community, for other professionals, for other schools, we're still talking about the same phenomenon. We're talking about the fact that whether you're funded on grant dollars or from you know, state dollars from however, your product is supposed to go to a group of people and you know who those people are. Um, if it's in uh, health, if it's in another, one of the other sciences, it's probably intended to go to folks that will benefit from what you have developed or what your uh, unit is developing or what your program or grant is developing. So we really are not limiting, although I, I recognize a number of my examples, we're talking about students and classes. We're not limiting this conversation to students. So, with that, let me put the mint down. I think my teeth are rattling. That's a weird sound. <clears throat> and I think as we get into the law, uh, uh, some of these distinctions I'll, I'll try to help make uh, as we go along, because there are different laws that, that do apply just to students, or do apply just to staff members, or do apply to community and community <coughs> members and constituents. Um, as we get into the law, it's really important for me that, that we don't lose focus here. And I think that there are a number of folks that are creating and designing excessively because it is the law, and that is frankly what is compelling them to do the work. We cannot get away from the human factor and the power that the internet has in our lives. And I like to um, read one, one of our partners in WebAIM from years um, since we started um, is a emeritus professor out of the Rochester Institute for, Te for Technology. His name is Norman Coombs, and he's been blind since birth. But we were having a discussion on what motivates webmasters, and he uh, provided this post and, and I just, I, I like it because for me, personally, it centers me on why it is that I do this work and why it is I would hope any of you would consider uh, 
doing this work. Okay, so that's the context. So it's just a discussion forum on motivating people to change. If webmasters could grasp one simple truth, most would take the bother. For example, I'm totally blind. When I was a kid, groceries were sold in friendly corner stores. Mom could send me there to get butter, sugar, whatever. The owner, the owner or a clerk at the cash register got the stuff and sold it to me. In fact, in those days, most people didn't get their groceries but asked the clerk. Well, you can't see he is an emeritus professor. But some of you might have had that similar experience. With the supermarket, now I am handicapped. No one at the cash register can leave their post to get my items. I cannot go to the store even when I'm out of food. If I can't get a friend, I'm in bad luck. Even if I pay a taxi to take me to the supermarket, what then? The driver won't shop for me. I, go, I grow hungry, or more likely, eat even more peanut butter. That's what I'm saying. Now we have homegrocer.com in some places. So here's a way that I can become a real human, he puts that in all caps, and buy food and eat. I go to their site, and guess what? I can't handle it with my screen reader. Here was a chance for me to become human again, and I'm robbed. Yes, it feels like I've been loved and left bleeding on the road. That's not a way. I could have gained independence and become a real person. Instead, I remain handicapped. If you were the responsible webmaster and had the power to make such a giant change in someone's life, what would you do? Let him be handicapped, that's all he's worth, or wow, what a fantastic opportunity I have to make a significant impact in the life of another person. So as we start talking about this legal piece, please remember that we are talking about human issues. We are talking about independence, we're talking about dignity, we're talking about life. So with that said, now we can talk about the law. But, but we, there are reasons that we have these laws in place in our, in our country so that the norms of the world can do what it is that they need to do and, and be fine. All right. So why would we create accessibly and how, did, how is it that it's a, this is going to interact with you? This, is my, this will be my quick um, little summary screen and then we'll get into the guts of each of them. Well, um, there are two sections of the Rehab Act, sections 504 and 508, that would compel you to see for certain populations. The Americans with Disabilities Act could compel you um, in some situations. Um, if any of you are working with the students in the K-12 systems, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act uh, would compel you in some instances. Telecommunications Act has some hardware provisions. And we've got uh, responses out of the Office for Civil Rights out of the U.S. Department of Ed that would also compel you in some situations. So, now we get to the meat of the matter. What is it that uh, your mother never told you about the law and web accessibility? I'm going to try and do a, a primer. And please do ask questions because this gets to be a little bit um, complicated as we go along. Frankly, uh, we are waiting in lots of instances for case law to determine what is going to be happening in this arena. And I'm going to say that right out. Uh, and let me ask, because um, I'm always interested, are there any attorneys or lawyers in the house? <laughs> I'm trying to pick on them from time to time. All right. Uh, well, you guys all know I am not a lawyer nor, or an attorney, so. Uh, uh, and so this is a legal advice. You may want to, you know, uh, look to your own campus people to do this stuff. But in higher education, and actually even in the K-12 system, and I'll let you guys uh, read that as I'm yapping on. Uh, Section 504 of the Rehab Act makes it very clear, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that individuals with disabilities shall not be discriminated in their education based on their disability status. So assuming that some of the uh, opportunities to participate and engage in, uh, in uh, education are on your web, that's something that has to be dealt with. Now one thing that I can say about Section 504 is that that's what the Disability Resource Center, Peggy, did I call that correct for this institution? What are you guys calling it? 
disability services. That is what that unit does. Students must self-disclose. They must register. And then it is Peggy's job to follow them and to make sure that they have accommodations that are reasonable for their needs. Now, where this gets a little bit tricky, to be honest with you, is that as more and more web content is developed, it will become increasingly difficult for Peggy to anticipate as she is uh, helping to advise students to take, uh, maybe they need to take, you know, I don't know, history class X. And there are several of them, and she knows that some of them are uh, accessible or, would, uh, or accommodations are present in some and not in others. Uh, uh, Still student choice, but she may be able to kind of corral them over into uh, areas where they would have an easier time being uh, accommodated and she doesn't have to do it again. You might get this about right. That's <laughs> over. But as things pop up on the web, it becomes harder and harder for her to stay on top of who's doing what. And remember, it is a student's right to select the course that they want. The institution can't say, Oh, if you want to take English 101, this is the one class you have to take. Because now we have discriminated. Because other students get to choose their classes, get to choose their professors, get to choose the time of day they want to take their class. So Section 504 is the, the major uh, piece of the law that deals with providing reasonable accommodations to students that have self-disclosed, they've re registered with disability services, and they're being tracked. Okay? This, is done. People talk about uh, web accessibility as if it's a new thing. This has been around since, does anyone know, 78. What's changed are the technologies we are now using to deliver education. But this has always been there. This covers a lot. Now, a number of you may have heard about Section 508, which is uh, they amended it, and they amended the, uh, they reauthorized the Rehabilitation Act. And there was already an existing Section 508, but then they added some bits and pieces to it. Now the big bit and piece that they added was a requirement that the federal government agencies uh, provide uh, accessible electronic information and technology. And what they, what they basically said is that you, the federal government has to provide all of this electronic information, technology in an accessible way, and they talk about all of it. I mean, there's you know, printers and fast faxes and kiosks and all of this kind of stuff, but also within that section, they actually, for the first time ever, use the word internet. So this is the first time this word is actually used. And it's been in place now uh, for, you know, what, two and a half years. Um, so that's been in place for all federal uh, goods and services that are procured. So if you, if a federal agency asks you to develop something for them, uh, you're probably going to have a provision in your contract that indicates that you're uh, going to have to do it for five or eight minutes. All right. Now, um, well, I pretty much talked about that. Okay. Um, what what has started happening though is that Section 508 is exploding in concept and in reality, and in part it's because it provides the first ever definition for what accessibility to the internet would be. Now we have the Web Accessibility Initiative, which is part of the W3C. And for those of you that don't know, the World Wide Web Consortium W3C. That's the international uh, body that uh, basically creates all the rules for the road for the internet. They're not regulatory at all, but they, these are the folks that are in the driver's seat deciding what happens on the World Wide Web. They're the folks that came up with the domain names, you know, .edu, .com, .net, .info, all that kind of stuff. And they had a, a work group in the 90s called the WAI, the Web Accessibility Initiative, that pulled together some guidelines for what it would mean for the global community to be developing with accessibility in mind. But again, this is not a regulatory context. Okay? With, those stand with those guidelines, the 
U.S. government went ahead and took actually several parts of them um, and put it into these guidelines. Uh, on webbing, in fact, let me show you where it is because it's really good to get to. Okay. One of the uh, one of the popular resources we have on our site is the 508 checklist. And just to let you see this, um, there are 16 standards in Section 508. Now, what you see over on the left-hand side is the actual legislative language that came out. So that's the regulatory language. That pass-fail thing, that's our interpretation. So that's not, don't interpret that to be the law. Um, but we've had a lot of um, co consensus from the field that we're just about right on. But, but as you read through what the federal government in the U.S. is requiring, you can kind of see uh, it's not horrible. <coughs> but right off our site, we think that it does provide um, you know, some guidance to people. So, let me go back. So we actually have a definition. And it's not, the WAI provided guidelines. So they uh, used uh, terms that were a little more conceptual in orientation. Our federal government used compliance language, regulatory language. Because of that, guess what? It could be monitored. So folks are sort of thinking that, well, you know, our federal government has a definition for uh, internet accessibility that lives in this little tiny section. What are the chances that once we start getting cases that are seen by the Supreme Court or, or something else pops uh, around the importance of internet accessibility, that they might go back to the existing federal definition that's found someplace else? People are saying it's likely. Now, it's entirely possible that in the next 10 years, we end up with 18 definitions of internet accessibility by our federal government. I mean, let's, let's be honest here. They've been known to do goofier things. So it's possible. But folks, uh, folks in the know believe it is most likely that the 508 regulations that exist now will probably be the ones that kind of get us, you know, subsumed over time and that's one of the reasons you guys hear about Section 508 all the time. But remember, in its inception, it was limited to services and goods and services procured by the federal government. Okay? So that means that um, you know, White House got done needs to be accessible, uh, Department of Ed needs to be accessible, uh, Health and Human Services, NASA, you know, all of those federal bits and pieces must be accessible, and they must make sure in their contracts that they are, are putting in place uh, uh, 508 language so that you know they're not uh, in a pickle. And I do have to say that there have been some uh, precedents in case law that uh, this, this really is, this whole transformation that's going on right now legally is exactly like the transformation that happened back in 1990 around the physical accommodations and the ADA. I mean, these are just virtual curb cuts is all we're talking about here. Um, but at that point in time, uh, let's say a Johns Hopkins would rent out a, a hall or let's say a hotel to do a conference in that wasn't accessible. Johns Hopkins, then if they got a complaint, couldn't say, well, we can't control that hotel's inaccessibility. The courts have declared, well, Johns Hopkins, it's your responsibility to only do business with people that are. So as court cases, came down on the side of physical accommodations. I think we all have a pretty good peek as a, a look in the future as to what is likely going to be happening. So if any of you are involved in grants right now, although I can say that I've not seen anything that says that grantees are required uh, because of Section 508 to create accessible products, what I can say is that if your product is intended for use anywhere within the federal realm, you better just do it because what could happen is that at a certain point in time, they may not be able to use it anymore. The other thing that I can say is that a number of institutions, and I'll get into this in a minute, are starting to put that language into their own 
contracts. So whoever your uh, Office of Sponsored Programs or Contracts and Manager person happens to be, they may not be looking for phrases like, uh, you know, we'll comply with all Section 508 regulations. They, they may not recognize that those were reauthorized and that those mean a different thing that they, they meant a different thing than they do now. So those things may actually be slipping into contracts that you have and you may not even know them. One of the other reasons that Section 508 um, is a big deal is frankly this one. States may actually be held accountable. <coughs> and this is where things get uh, very confusing. Okay, let me do a brief history. Um, there is uh, an act called the uh, Assistive Technology Act of 1998. And that provides federal monies for states uh, actually to, uh, <coughs> to help uh, citizens with disabilities procure the assistive technologies that they need and train them in using them and setting up systems to you know, help keep that going. That is a, um, uh, that's an opt-in program. So people don't have to take the millions of federal dollars every, each state that each state can have in this act. However, at this point in time, every state in our uh, 50 state union and uh, all but I think one territory has opted in on, the, on this money. Now in order to get this money on a year to year basis, the state has to sign what are called assurances. And the assurances are nothing more than uh, our state, uh, Maryland assures the federal government that we do all the right things. You know, we have equal opportunity affirmative action programs in place. We have certain budgeting and accounting and fiscal things in place so you know we're not, you know, skid of the money. And we have this in place and we have this in place. Those are the assurances that they sign. Well, another set of assurances is, and we provide, and, uh, to get the Tech Act money, and we comply with all Section 508 regulations that are at a federal level. So by signing that assurance, by taking that money from the federal government, there is an implication that the states are going to, at the level of the state agencies, comply with uh, accessible electronic information technology, including the internet. Now it gets a little uh, murkier because in some states, education is, is a state agency. And I don't know how...